This is Gerald Clark, December 1st, 2017. I wanted to uh, facilitate a dialogue about some issues with Krista, so I wrote down a couple of questions for her to look up and, and uh, respond to. So here's the first one. It's just something I've noticed. And my question is, how come humans don't have teeth to eat meat? And if you go all the way back to when we were genetically augmented, whether it was with the uh, Neanderthal or Cro-Magnum, if you look at their teeth, they still had teeth just like we do, so. Thanks, Gerald, for initiating this. You're right, I did a Google search on Neanderthal teeth and they look strikingly like ours. They don't have fangs or big, sharp, animalistic teeth, and they look very much like our teeth. If you compare that to other carnivorous animals, they have much different teeth. I looked up the tiger, for example, or the alligator, or a bear. They look much different than ours. Let's also look at a couple of articles with outside research and dig a little deeper. On this first article, found on celestialhealing.net, entitled, How Humans Are Not Physically Created to Eat Meat, there is a quote by the prominent Swedish scientist Carl von Linn, who states, Man's structure, external and internal, compared with that of the other animals, shows that fruit and succulent vegetables constitute his natural food. Then the article goes on to compare herbivores and humans. And this was really interesting. For instance, meat eaters have claws. Herbivores and humans do not. Meat eaters have no skin pores and perspire through the tongue, whereas herbivores and humans perspire through skin pores. Meat eaters have sharp front teeth for tearing, with no flat molar teeth for grinding, where herbivores and humans do not have the sharp front teeth, but have flat rear molars for grinding their food. Meat eaters have an intestinal tract that is only three times their body length so that rapidly decaying meat can pass through quickly, whereas herbivores and humans have an intestinal tract 10 to 12 times their body length. Meat eaters have strong hydrochloric acid in, in their stomachs to digest meat, where herbivores and humans have stomach acid that is 20 times weaker than that of any meat eater. Meat eaters' salivary glands in their mouth are not needed to pre-digest grains and fruits, whereas herbivores and humans have well-developed salivary glands which are necessary to pre-digest grains and fruit. Meat eaters have acid saliva with no enzyme fatalin to pre-digest grains, where herbivores and humans are able to pre-digest their grains, and they also look at the difference in their teeth as well. The next article is found on the HuffingtonPost.com by Kathy Freston, Shattering the Meat Myth, Humans are Natural Vegetarians. One of my favorite researchers, Dr. T. Colin Campbell, professor emeritus at Cornell University and author of the China Study, explains that in fact, we only recently, historically speaking, began eating meat, and that the inclusion of meat in our diet came well after we became who we are today. He explains that the birth of agriculture only started about 10,000 years ago at a time when it became considerably more convenient to herd animals. This is not nearly as long as the time that fashioned our basic biochemical functionality, at least tens of millions of years, and which functionality depends on the nutrient composition of plant-based foods. That jibes with the Physician Committee for Responsible Medicine President Dr. Neil Bernard, who says in his book, The Power of Your Plate, in which he explains that early humans had diets very much like other great apes, which is said to have a largely plant-based diet drawing on foods we can pick with our hands. Research suggests that meat eating probably began by scavenging eating the leftovers that carnivores had left behind. However, our bodies have never adapted to it. To this day, meat eaters have a higher incidence of heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and other problems. It goes on to say that there is no more authoritative source on anthropological issues than paleontologist Dr. Richard Leakey, who explains that anyone who has taken an introductory physiology course might have discerned intuitively that humans are herbivores. Leakey notes that you can't tear flesh by hand and you can't tear hide by hand. We wouldn't have been able to deal with the food source that required those large canines. Although we have teeth that are called canines, they bear little resemblance to the canines of carnivores. The article continues from there and closes saying, but in in fact, top nutritional and anthropological scientists from the most reputable institutions 
imaginably say categorically that humans are natural herbivores and that we will be healthier today if we stick with our herbivorous roots. It may be inconvenient, but alas, it is the truth. Question number two, how is uric acid related to fascial plasticity and muscular tightness? And this is something I personally experienced, so I want to see what uh, data she's come up with on that. And, and for those who don't know, uric acid comes from eating meat. I learned all about fascia from you with structural integration. And in case others don't know, our fascia is our connective tissue that surrounds our muscles, our bones, our nerves, and our blood vessels. We know that when we have high levels of uric acid in the body, this can lead to joint inflammation, muscle stiffness, joint stiffness. It can cause gout, arthritis symptoms, and much more. The uric acid comes from the food we eat, like Gerald mentioned, and if we have too much in our body, then it's not properly processed. In theory, if we change our eating patterns, we should reduce our stiffness. In yoga journals, guides, and books, and other studies, it's strongly recommended to give up eating meat and discuss as uric acid in food and its effects along with other studies. Yogis often fast to reduce levels of uric acid. Another method is taking on the plant-based lifestyle. Gerald originally tried vegetarianism to increase his flexibility in yoga, and he's never looked back, only taking it further, going vegan. Here are a few articles that talk about uric acid. In the article by Livestrong.com, entitled, What Happens with Too Much Uric Acid in Your Body by Nadia Harris, it talks about the side effects as well as what you can do about it. High blood levels of uric acid can cause uric acid salt crystals to form in your joints, leading to a condition called gout. This results from abnormal deposits of urate crystals around the cartilage of the joints. These spiky salts find their way into the joint fluid, causing inflammation, stiffness, swelling, and pain. In another article on livemint.com entitled Joint Pain, check your uric acid level. High uric acid levels can be one of the main causes of gout and can even lead to diabetes, blood pressure, and heart disease. This is by Kavita Devgan. It goes on to state how in most cases, high levels of uric acid tend to be detected when people are diagnosed with other disorders like heart disease. People often come late because they ignore initial signs and symptoms. Joints and muscular pain are often attributed to fatigue or exertion and then it goes on to explain how uric acid is a chemical produced in the body when it breaks down foods that contain organic compounds called purines most uric acid gets devolves, dissolved in the blood filtered through the kidneys and expelled through urines however when it produces too much it does not filter out accumulation over time can lead to gout which can then lead to obesity high blood pressure diabetes heart disease it causes a form of arthritis typically characterized by large swollen joints, mainly in the ankle joints or on the inner side of the leg. You can get arthropathy, which is tender ankles, warm to the touch, gradually becoming difficult to walk and painful. It's a painful condition. It can happen in more than one joint. This has been increasingly seen in young people due to the excessive protein intake, high consumption of non-vegetarian food, as well as alcohol consumption. The good news is that diet line lifestyle can increase and improve your results. This is an article found in the Yoga Journal, page 49, from released January of February of 1987. It asserts, opponents also assert that meat eaters poison themselves by overloading their bodies with the toxic byproducts of meat metabolism, urea and uric acid. Under ordinary circumstances, the kidneys excrete these poisonous and nitrogenous compounds. When the kidneys become strained, however, the unexcreted uric acid is deposited throughout the body, where it tends to harden and crystallize. When this happens in the joints, it creates painful arthritis, gout, and rheumatism. When it collects in the nerves, it can cause sciatica. Many people with such conditions, in fact, are now being advised by doctors to drastically cut back on meat or eliminate it entirely from their diets. So this is how uric acid is related to muscle tightness. Question number three. How are yoga and structural integration complementary to one another? And uh, hopefully you'll expound on what SI is and uh, what, what the goal is and how they relate. Okay, so we'll start by taking a look at yoga and then take a look at structural integration and then correlate how they are connected and how they can relate to one another and complement. So yoga is a mixture of physical, mental, and spiritual. In Sanskrit, the word yoga means to yoke, to unite, to join. 
union. Yoga is used not only for a physical practice, but also to expand the spirit, reach a new state of consciousness, hopefully transcend, and maybe one day become enlightened. Often in the practice, students are working with breath, meditation, aligning and working with gravity, stretching, elongating their spines, increasing the space between their vertebrae. In some practices, awakening their kundalini force and rising that energy up their chakras, learning to step into the moment and achieve a non-dualistic state of mind and body and spirit. It's not all about your bum and your abs, it's much deeper. And on a more physical level, it does bring you greater flexibility, length, better posture, and can give some bigger changes, especially when practice slow. Structural integration, aka SI, or some people call it rolfing, is a form of bodywork that focuses on the connective tissue, the fascia that we discussed earlier. Fascia is meant to move freely with your muscles and bones, but more often than not, it's stuck, it's tight, it's short, and it's lost elasticity. Gerald would tell me that Dr. Ida P. Roth, the founder, would say, anywhere you have a bone, consider the fascia is stuck or anywhere your skin or your fascia crosses a bone, consider that it's stuck. So far for me, this is true. And when our fascia is tight, it pulls on our body, our structure, it pulls us out of alignment, resulting, resulting in shoulders that slouch forward, a hump on the back of our necks as we grow older, near our C7, the back of our neck right there, right where your shoulders come out, a lot of pain, discomfort, bad posture, a loss of energy. And a lot of times we get grouchy because we're in pain. Structural integration uses a series of 10, and they're designed by Dr. Ida P. Rolf to align your body into the gravity field by lengthening, stretching, and softening this tissue, adding the fluidity back into it, using a mixture of pressure and tension, temperature, frequency, and very, very slow, slow speed. You actually move so slow you can, you can physically feel as the practitioner and the patient, the fascia changing beneath your hands, it's, it's pretty wild. And the results are astounding. You can take a random body, which I, Dr. IDP Rolf insisted, we are all random bodies, and you can realign it, gaining inches in height, and in some cases, increasing your energy as your spine grows longer, the nodes get more space between them, it gets you know straight if you had a kink in it, obviously it's not gonna work as great as if it were upright, and energetic chakra channels run more freely, and as Gerald, demonstrates in his EQ5A from his book, The Anunnaki of Nibiru, he directly correlates how that energy is related to gravity and in this process, how you can awaken it. When we first met, I was practicing yoga daily on a path to become an instructor when we kind of, when we crossed paths. Gerald was raving about structural integration and how it could change my body, reshaping it like plastic. And to me, I'd never heard of such a thing, but he was adamant that it was better than yoga. And at the time, yoga for me was the penultimate, so I was skeptical how this could be true, but of course, very curious. Fast forward to receiving the work, I had more energy than I knew what to do with. I grew in height, changed the position of my pelvis, and as a result, it was as though my energetic body was turned on for the first time, really awakening to what a lot of the yogis sometimes talk about in, you know, when you, once you've practiced for 20 some odd years. And as a result, it deepened my yoga practice. So yoga and structural integration, or SI, complement each other like nobody's business. They're essentially after similar things, aligning in the gravity field, gaining length in your spine, more flexibility, and the great byproduct of it all is a greater spiritual development, faster kundalini awakening, and as Ida said, it's the freight train to evolution. So hop on board, my friends. I'll link Gerald's recommended source below for the Rolf Guild. Number four, does a vegan lifestyle prevent erectile dysfunction? <laughs> uh, I read a statistic not long ago that uh, over, what was it, 50% of people over the age of 40 have erectile dysfunction? Oh, wow. So anyway, um, there's been some studies on that, and I think it'd be good for you to present that. So that's it. Gerald Clark, December 1st, 2017, and we out. Thanks, Gerald, and thanks for coming on and asking these questions. That was really fun today. And ED or erectile dysfunction is terrible, and I'm really sorry for anyone who has to go through that. But did you know that it doesn't have to be that way? And a study found that normal sexual function can return by changing your dietary patterns. So let us take a look at those reports, and then I'll say goodbye.
The first article is by Dr. Neil Bernard, published April 16, 2015, entitled Diet Away Erectile Dysfunction. In the article, he talks about how approximately 44% of men with heart disease risk factors such as ED are unaware of their risk. The result in that is the millions and billions of dollars that are spent that could be saved. The part of the article I wanted to focus on was the very end. It states, but arteries can literally open up again simply by adopting a low-fat, plant-based diet. A study in JAMA found that normal sexual function returned in almost one-third of the men who ate less saturated fat and cholesterol, both of which are abundant in animal products and more fiber only found in plant-based foods. The best way to keep the blood pumping is a plant-based diet. The next article is on PETA. It is entitled, A Vegan Diet Can Help With Impotence. It talks about how every year, more and more men across the world are suffering from this problem, and that the good news is, medical science suggests that all of these conditions can be managed, or in some cases, even prevented with a low-fat vegan diet. They even have a fun video for you to watch if you want to see that. It goes on to say, Viagra and other anti-impotence drugs may get you through the night, but a vegetarian diet can get you through your life. Numerous physicians and nutritionists agree that the best way to prevent artery blockage, as well as multiple other conditions that cause impotence, is to eat a diet high in fiber, including plenty of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. These foods will scrub the plaque off the art arterial walls to get your blood flowing and your love life going back in no time. You can check out their vegan starter kit or go to artisticvegan.com for plenty of recipes. It has a question on here, why can't I eat all the meat that I want and then just take Viagra? And they state the answer is simple. Viagra often doesn't work, it has side effects and is expensive. Up to 25% of the men who take it report absolutely no improvement at all. For some guys, Viagra brings disturbing side effects such as vision, prob vision problems. And just one dose of Viagra costs you $10. You need to pop a pill every time you want to achieve an erection. That's a lot more expensive than switching to a bean and veggie burrito instead of a fried chicken or fish filet. What if I'm already experiencing impotent? It's not too late. Even if your impotence is caused by your blood pressure medication, going vegan may help you lower your blood pressure naturally and enable you to wean yourself off the medication that is hindering your ability to achieve a hard and lasting erection. Cutting meat and dairy products out of your diet is a great way to lower your cholesterol and blood pressure naturally and help get your equipment back in working condition. And the last article I wanted to share was posted by Forks Over Knives on January 24th, 2012, entitled Raise the Flag with a Vegan Diet. They have a really fun video that you can watch and it has information from doctors, so you can go ahead and check that out there. And the very, very last thing I wanted to share was just something that I've stumbled upon that is really fantastic. And I'll just share this article with you and let it speak for itself. Beetroot to boost your libido and get a better erection. Is beetroot the vegetable of love? Believe it or not, beetroot is the one vegetable that can have an immense impact on your sexual life, especially for men. This is not to say that women won't benefit from the root, ve root vegetable to beat sexual inactivity. Some studies suggest that beetroot works in a similar manner as does drugs prescribed for erectile dysfunction. This root vegetable is rich in nitrates, a naturally found inorganic element present in air, water, and certain foods. Consumption of beetroot helps one suffering from low libido or erectile dysfunction to increase the levels of nitric oxide in the body which boost sexual health. When you eat beetroot, the nitrates present in the vegetable are converted into nitrate in the mouth by the bacteria present in the oral cavity. When the vegetable is chewed and swallowed, the bacteria in the stomach converts it into nitric oxide, a gas that helps blood vessels to dilate and boost circulation. Regular consumption of beetroot helps blood vessels in the genitals to open up and improve circulation. This helps in better erection in men during sexual intercourse and helps last longer in bed too. In fact, nitrate suppl supplementation from beetroot juice is seen to give best results for improving sexual health and stamina. Anyways, it goes on from there, but beets are pretty awesome. <laughs> Thanks for spending time with me. This has been Krista with ArtisticVegan.com. Go over to my website to get plenty of free plant-based recipes.